In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation, through Christ our Lord. Amen. St. Isaac Jogues, pray for us. St. Anthony de Padua, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. Mary, the Immaculate Conception, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please stand for a gospel reading. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. As were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and given in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark. And they did not know until the flood came and swept them all away. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One is taken and one is left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One is taken, and one is left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the householder had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have watched and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The Gospel of the Lord. If we open up a newspaper, we will notice that there are many different sections there. For example, the sports section, the business section, the entertainment section. And most of the people that we will ever know in our life, including ourselves, our names will never be found in those sections of the newspaper that I just mentioned. However, Everyone that we know in our life, including ourselves, our names will be found in one section of the newspaper, and that is the obituary. For we all know that we are going to die one day. No one escapes death. This is one truth, one fact that cannot be denied. And by this one fact, this one truth, that we are all going to die, this should serve as the basis and foundation for every single choice that we make in this temporary short life on earth. Why? Because when death comes, then there will be judgment. And then after judgment, there will be heaven or hell. These four things mentioned is known as eschatology, the study of the four last things. Notice, I did not say death, judgment, heaven, and hell. I reference death, judgment, heaven, 
or hell. The last two, we will be only in one or the other for all eternity. And so tonight, I would like to dive deeper regarding the four last things. I know I mentioned them more briefly in my weekend homily, but tonight, I'd like to dive deeper. What are we to expect at death and at judgment, which is inevitable? What has God revealed regarding the afterlife? And when I teach about the four last things tonight, it is vitally important that I reference and quote several official church documents. The reason for this is so that when you walk away from tonight's talk, you are confident that what was taught was not Father Jewel Itona's personal opinion, but rather was official church teaching. So first and foremost, we have death. A good question that people have asked throughout the history of mankind is, why must we die? That is, physically perish from this earth. Why can we not live forever here in this world? And it is a good question to ask, yet the church has always provided the answer, and that is, death is a consequence of sin. If you were here during my talk on Sunday, I spoke about how the first sin, the sin of Adam, also known as the fall, that brought forth spiritual death, death to one's soul. Yet that first sin also brought forth physical death, that we must perish from this earth. The Catechism of the Catholic Church confirms this, in paragraph 402, it says, All men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms. By one man's disobedience, many, that is, all men, were made sinners. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all men sin. Now, just so that we are confident that this paragraph is not only referring to spiritual death, but extends to physical death, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 400, says this. The consequence explicitly told, foretold for this disobedience, referring to Adam's disobedience, will come true. Man will return to the ground, for out of it he was taken. Death makes its entrance into human history. Now, as scary and as dark and perhaps even discouraging death may sound, because Christ has come, he has transformed death into a blessing. There now is a positive meaning to death. And I will speak about this more later on. I just wanted to briefly reference this now, just so that we are not hanging our heads throughout the entirety of tonight's presentation. So just hang tight. I again will speak more about that later on. After death comes judgment. St. Paul in the sacred scriptures, in his second letter to Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 says this. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. Referring to what was done while we are in the body here on earth. At the moment of our judgment, there will be no more opportunity for change. That is, no more opportunity for repentance. It will be likened to the making of pottery. When a person is making pottery and the clay pot is still wet, when it is still moist, it is subject to change, modification, alteration. But once that clay pot is put into the heat of the fire, it becomes 
hardened, and it will then remain in that shape forever. There will be no more turning back. There will be no more opportunity for change, alteration, or modification. So much so it will be at the moment of our judgment. The state of our soul at that moment of judgment, our state of our soul will be put into the fire, so to speak, become hardened, and it will remain in that state forever. There will be no more turning back, no more opportunity for change, alteration, or modification. At the moment of our judgment, our soul will be compared, so to speak, to Christ. The Catechism of the Catholic Church confirms this in paragraph 1022. It says, each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death in a particular judgment that refers his life to Christ. Now, in addition to this particular judgment that I just mentioned from the catechism, that is at the moment of a person's death, there does exist another judgment, which is called the last judgment. We are, we are all familiar with this last judgment because when we go to mass on Sundays, when we profess the creed, we say the following words. He, referring to Jesus, will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. This refers to the end of the world, the end of time when Jesus will return one day. This is also known as Jesus' second coming, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. And the reality is, we do not know the day nor the hour when this will take place. It could happen tonight. The bottom line is, we always have to be ready to give an account of our life before God. So, to give a clarification here, those who physically die before Jesus' second coming, when Jesus returns in his second coming, those who already died, their bodies will rise from the dead, and Jesus at the second coming will judge the living and the dead. There are further descriptions of this last judgment when Jesus returns found in the Bible. It's spoken about in different parts of the Bible. In the Catechism of the Catholic Church, in paragraph 1038, this paragraph does a great job in gathering together those different descriptions of Jesus' second coming and putting them all in one paragraph. So I'll read this paragraph, and again, this is what will happen at the last judgment when Jesus returns. It is not a matter of if it will happen, it will happen. We just do not know again when it will happen. So that paragraph from the Catechism says this, the resurrection of all the dead, of both the just and the unjust will precede the last judgment. This will be the hour when all who are in the tombs will hear the Son of Man's voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. Then Christ will come in his glory and all the angels with him. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will place the sheep at his right hand, but the goats at his left, and they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So just to provide an even further clarification, those who already die before Jesus' second coming, 
the sentence that they received at their particular judgment at death, that sentence that they received will not change at Jesus' second coming when he comes and to give the last judgment. The sentence that those people received at their particular judgment at death that they received before Jesus' second coming, that sentence will be repeated at the last judgment. Or as I mentioned earlier, that at a moment's particular judgment, there will be no more opportunity for change, no more opportunity for repentance. At this last judgment, when Jesus will judge the living and the dead, all of our actions, that is all of the conduct that we have ever done in our life, will be exposed and seen by everybody. Just think about it. Jesus Christ has said in the gospel that he is the light of the world. If we, for example, light a candle in a pitch dark room and we take that candle that's lit and wherever we go, that lit candle will scatter the darkness. That is everything that was hidden in the darkness will now be exposed by the light. So when Jesus comes again in his second coming, and he is and will be the light of the world, when we are all standing and appearing before him, his divine light will scatter all darkness and everything hidden about us will be exposed by his divine light and will be seen by everyone. Additionally, Jesus said in the gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the light. Well, when Jesus comes again in his second coming, and he will come as truth incarnate, when we were all appear before him, appearing before truth himself, then there will be no room for falsity. Uh, there will be no uh, hidden confidential information about us that will be left secret because we will all be before truth himself. This teaching is confirmed in the sacred scripture and also the catechism of the Catholic Church. In St. Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 5, it says, So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord's return, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 678, says, Jesus announced the judgment of the last day in his preaching. Then will the conduct of each one and the secrets of hearts be brought to light. Additionally, at this last judgment, at the end of the world, all of the consequences of our actions will also be revealed. The Catechism of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1039, it confirms this when it says, the last judgment will reveal even to its furthest consequences the good each person has done or failed to do during his earthly life. So this teaching that I mentioned, that when Jesus returns at his second coming and all of our actions will be exposed and seen by everyone, this in and of itself is sufficient reason for us not to commit sin. Of course, uh, the ultimate reason and goal for us to not commit sin and choose the good is ultimately out of love for God, right? Because he's deserving of all of our love. That is the goal. Yet at the same time, again, this truth is even a sufficient and valid reason for us to not commit sin because at the end of the day, everyone is going to know what we have done. Even things, for example, that are done in the privacy of our one's own room. So I mentioned this just to serve it as, as an incentive for you and for me to always think twice 
before every single choice that we make in this temporary short life on earth. Now, going back to the pottery analogy, just like how if we have a disfigured clay pot and that disfigured clay pot is put into the heat of the fire and it becomes hardened and it will then remain in that disfigured shape forever, so much so at a person's death and at judgment, if their soul is disfigured, that is in a state of unrepentant mortal sin, which separates a person from God, then that soul in that disfigured state will become hardened, so to speak, and it will then remain in that disfigured state that is separated from God forever. There will be no more turning back. And thus, this brings me to my point, to, to a point in my talk, to speak about the reality of hell. The church speaks and teaches about hell in the Council of Florence, session six. It says, the souls of those who depart this life in actual mortal sin or in original sin alone, go down straight away to hell to be punished, but with unequal pains. So as I mentioned earlier, what St. Paul said in the scriptures, he said, each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. Not everyone in hell will be experiencing the same thing. There are several different descriptions of hell found in the Word of God, divine revelation in the sacred scriptures, and I think it would be beneficial that I mention just some of them. The scriptures says that hell is a lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20, a place of everlasting burnings, Isaiah 33, a place of torments, Luke 16, a place of everlasting punishment, Matthew 25, a place where they gnaw on their tongues, Revelation 16, a place where they wail, Matthew 13, a place of sorrows, Psalm 18, a place of weeping, Matthew 8. A place of blackness and darkness forever, the book of Jude. A place where they have no rest, Revelation 14. A place of filthiness, Revelation 22. A place where they do not want their loved ones to go. Luke 16. Now, in addition to descriptions found in the Bible, there does also exist what is called private revelations. That is claims by people such as saints regarding what they saw in visions. Now, I must be perfectly clear here regarding how we are to view private revelations. Private revelations are not part of what is called divine public revelation. That would mean that the private revelations are not obligatory to believe in, whereas divine public revelation, we are obliged to believe in as it is part of God's divine public revelation. So when the church approves of a private revelation, the church is simply saying that what is being claimed is not contrary to Catholic doctrine, and what is being uh, claimed is worthy of belief. Therefore, Catholics are permitted to believe these approved private revelations, but not obligated to believe them. Now, that being said, I personally would say that 
as holy and as virtuous as the saints were, I think it would be foolish to think that the saints were liars. Therefore, I personally would say that there would be every reason to believe in the claims that saints say they saw and seen in private revelations. That being said, I will now provide a private revelation from St. Maria Faustina, known as the Apostle of Mercy, regarding what she claimed seeing regarding hell. This is found in her diary called Divine Mercy in My Soul. She said, Today I was led by an angel to the chasm of hell. It is a place of great torture. How awesomely large and extensive it is. The kinds of tortures that I saw. The first torture that constitutes hell is the loss of God. The second is perpetual remorse of conscience. The third is that one's condition will never change. The fourth is the fire that will penetrate the soul without destroying it. A terrible suffering since it is a purely spiritual fire lit by God's anger. The fifth torture is continual darkness and a terrible suffocating smell. And despite the darkness, the devil and the souls of the damned see each other in all the evil, both of others and of their own. The sixth torture is the constant company of Satan. The seventh torture is horrible despair, hatred of God, vile words, curses, and blasphemies. These are the tortures suffered by all the damned together, but that is not the end of their sufferings. There are special tortures destined for particular souls. These are the torments of the senses. Each soul undergoes terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. There are caverns and pits of tortures where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these tortures if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity in those senses which he made use of to sin. I am writing this at the command of God, so that no soul may find an excuse by saying there is no hell, or that nobody has ever been there, and so no one can say what it is like. What I have written is but a pale shadow of the things I saw. But I noticed one thing, that most of the souls there are those who disbelieved that there is a hell. So as scary and as dark as hell and eternal damnation may sound, and this really should make our knees knock, I do want to end this part of my talk on a positive note. And that is, God is for us and not against us. I referenced during my weekend homily, for the sake of those who were not there, I referenced that the scripture says that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. 
This is commonly known as God has a salvific will. To use an analogy, and again, a repeat for those who were not here during my weekend homily, you can imagine yourself a student, and you go to the university, and you take a class, and you have a teacher who loves you so much, who desires you to pass that class so badly that he offers all of his help, all of his assistance. He bends over backwards, if you will, even to the point where he says to you that I am willing to even die for you to assist you to pass this class. Well, this is the reality of the spiritual life. Christ, our good teacher, has come and has come to offer his abundant grace and has come to literally die for us, to give us hope in passing the class, so to speak, that is the hope of eternal life and to not perish for all eternity in hell. Yet, as the saying goes, you could bring a horse to water but you can't force it to drink. Christ does truly bring us to the refreshing water, so to speak, by providing his grace, especially the prayer and the sacraments, but he doesn't force anyone to drink. Thus, as a person has free choice and free will, a person can choose to freely reject the graces of God and choose to not persevere in God's sanctifying grace until the end. Therefore, at the end of the day, a person who ends up in hell, they are there because they send themselves there, because the choice is ultimately theirs. Now, speaking of choices, to go back to the pottery analogy again, a person can choose Christ in his sanctifying grace until the end, so therefore, just like how if we have a properly shaped clay pot and it is then put into the, feet, the heat of the fire and it becomes hardened and it will then remain in that proper shape forever, so much so at a person's death and judgment, if their soul is in a proper shape, that is, if that soul is in a state of God's sanctifying grace, which justifies them into heaven because there's friendship with God, unity with God by that sanctifying grace, then again, that soul will be hardened and it will remain in that state forever. And even if that soul may have to pass through purgatory, which is what I will speak about later on, that soul will eventually enter into the kingdom of heaven and experience eternal beatitude and experience the beatific vision of God and experience eternal bliss and joy and happiness forever for all eternity. Which of course brings me to the point in my talk to speak about God's heavenly kingdom. The church teaches about heaven from the Council of Florence, chapter 6, saying, excuse me, let me back up here, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1024, describes heaven as the state of supreme definitive happiness. The Council of Florence, chapter 6, session 6, says of those in heaven that they, quote, clearly behold the triune God as he is, yet one person more perfectly than another according to the difference of their merits. So as I mentioned earlier, that not everybody in hell will be experiencing the same thing. So it will be the case in the kingdom of heaven, as what was mentioned earlier from St. Paul in the sacred scriptures. He said that each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. Now, speaking about heaven, it would be beneficial for us to know the difference between what is called a nominal definition versus a real definition. So if you, we were to look up the, in the dictionary what a nominal definition is, it says something that is, that it is used to describe something that is said to be a particular thing, 
but is not actually that thing. So I'm going to give you an example here. Let's say you ask me, Father Jewel, what is nougat? Now, I may give you two different answers. I may say, well, nougat is just that stuff inside a Three Musketeers candy bar. And you, eat, have, having experience eating a Three Musketeers candy bar, will say, oh, well, yes, I know what you're talking about. It's that soft, fluffy stuff that I chew on when I bite into a Three Musketeers candy bar. That would be an example of a nominal definition of nougat. I may give you a different answer of a nougat, and I may say that nougat is sugar, corn syrup, egg whites, etc., etc., giving the ingredients. That would be a real definition of nougat. Well, when we speak about heaven, and as we try to describe heaven, while we are still here on earth, we can only give a nominal definition and description of the kingdom of heaven. We could only use symbols, images, to try and help our mind just grasp some notion and idea of what heaven is like. We cannot give a real definition and description of heaven while we're still here on earth. Why? Because God created our minds limited. He did not create our minds to have the ability to understand how great heaven is while we're still on earth. For heaven, his heavenly kingdom, is completely off of the charts. There are no words that exist in human language that has the ability to describe how great heaven is. Just to give a repeat, again, for the sake of those who are not here during my weekend homily, you could think of the greatest experience that you've ever had in your life and multiply it by 10 million. And even that would fall short in describing the kingdom of heaven. That would only give you just a mere idea just to get the ball rolling, so to speak, of what the kingdom of heaven is like. You see, God knew that if we could describe heaven in a real way while we are still here on earth using human language or to even try and use human activities to uh, try and describe heaven, such as, oh, you know, heaven is like Hawaii or heaven is like the Bahamas. Well, then a person will then think, if that's the case, well, then I'll just go over there right now. And then they won't think that the real heaven is, is that big of a deal. Oh, no, that's not the way God set it up. God made heaven completely off of the charts that we do not even have the ability to describe it. So it says in the scriptures that no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor has, e nor has it ever conceived in the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. So the catechism, the Catholic Church, confirms that we can only use a nominal definition of heaven. It doesn't use that term nominal, but it's implied. In paragraph 1027, when it says, this mystery of blessed communion with God and all who are in Christ is beyond all understanding and description. Scripture speaks of it in images. Life, light, peace, wedding feast, wine of the kingdom, the Father's house, the heavenly Jerusalem, paradise. And then it quotes St. Paul, what I just referenced, and I'll just repeat it again because that's what it says in the paragraph. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that there are saints who claimed to have seen in private revelations of the vision of hell, there are some saints who, while living here on earth, received the vision of heaven. And thus, they tried to describe in their private revelations 
what they saw. And so I'd like to provide you some accounts from some saints regarding what they tried their best to explain heaven. You will notice that when I quote these saints, they're trying their best to use human language of what they saw, but they all more or less throw in the towel and they simply say, we just can't explain it. So one of them was St. Faustina. This can be found, again, in her diary called Divine Mercy in My Soul. She said this regarding what she saw about heaven. Today I was in heaven, in spirit, and I saw its inconceivable beauties and the happiness that awaits us after death. I saw how all creatures give ceaseless praise and glory to God. I saw how great happiness is, is happiness in God, which spreads to all creatures, making them happy. And then all the glory and praise, which springs from this happiness, returns to its source, and they enter into the depths of God contemplating the inner life of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whom they will never comprehend or fathom. This source of happiness is unchanging in its essence, but it is always new, gushing forth happiness for all creatures. The glory of God is so great that I dare not try to describe it because I would not be able to do so. And souls might think that what I have written is all there is. Another saint by the name of Saint Anna Shaper, who lived in the late 19th century and early 20th century, she claims this regarding private revelation of heaven. She said, while I was praying, I was enraptured from the world. My life was hanging by a thread. The clouds opened up and a marvelous garden full of flowers appeared in which I could walk a long distance. There are also meadows and forests rivers and mountains, homes and buildings, but everything is transparent and spiritualized, while here on earth, everything is tainted by the curse of sin. It was terrible then when I had to return to the world. Now, all I want is to die. I cannot describe to you all of the marvels that our good God gives to, lo to those he loves. There is another saint by the name of Saint John Bosco. It is known that he had received prophetic dreams. In one of these dreams, Saint Dominic Savio appeared to him. St. Dominic Savio was a student of his, and St. Dominic had died before St. John Bosco did. And in this dream, St. Dominic Savio instructed St. John Bosco to look out towards the farthest end of a crystal sea. And when he did that, St. John Bosco said, I looked, a sudden streak of light Flash through space, fine as a thread, but so brilliant, so piercing, that my gaze faltered in pain. The filament of light was a hundred million times brighter than the sun. Its brilliance could have lit up our entire universe. I asked Dominic, was not that a heavenly beam? Saint Dominic replied, it was not a supernatural light. It was nothing more than earthly light 
rendered ever so dazzling by God's power. Even if a vast array of light as strong as the ray you saw at the end of that crystal sea were to cover the whole world, it would still not give you an idea of the splendor of paradise. Then St. John Bosco asked St. Dominic, then what do you enjoy in paradise? And St. Dominic responded, ah, oh, that defies all telling. The happiness of heaven no mortal beings can ever know until they die and are reunited with their maker. We enjoy God, nothing else. So my dear friends, there is a lot to look forward to in the kingdom of heaven. As I was referencing hell earlier, of course, as that may make us tremble, the spiritual life is not about just what to avoid, but it's also about what to run to. And that is to run to and be embraced by God and ultimately experience his vision in the kingdom of heaven. So yes, we can and should have a healthy fear, but it just doesn't end there. We should be striving for love of God and knowing what to be desiring for. So just for the sake of those who are not here during my weekend homily, I think it's worth mentioning that many saints and early church fathers are in agreement as what to speculate the resurrected body will be able to do in the kingdom of heaven. This is called the qualities of the resurrected body, and they come to these speculations based off of descriptions in the Bible. So I'll mention these more briefly. The body in heaven will be able to experience what is called impassibility, which means that the body will, be able, will no longer be able to experience any pain, no more suffering, no more tears of sorrow, no headache, no backache, no cancer. The body will be able to experience what is called brightness, which means that the body will actually be bright like the sun. The body in heaven will be able to experience what is called agility, which means that wherever the soul desires the body to be in heaven, it will be there in an instant. And one of the other qualities that I did not mention during my weekend homily is that the body will be able to experience what is called subtlety. This simply means that our bodies in heaven will be free from the things that, ref that refrain them here while here on earth. We know that when we are in the body here on earth, our body has limitations. Uh, for example, I, I can't just jump from the top of the roof of this church and jump over to the Detroit airport. Uh, I, I, there are physical limitations. Well, our bodies in heaven won't have limitations because our bodies will be like the angels. Our Lord himself said that in the Gospel of Luke when he spoke about the resurrection of the body. He said they will be like angels. Well, angels are not corporal beings. They are purely spiritual beings. And as they are not, don't have those physical limitations, so will our body also likewise in heaven. I think it's worth mentioning too that there is a strong speculation that the age of the body in heaven will actually be 33 years of age. 33 years of age is known that that's when our Lord died on the cross and it's also believed that the year 33 is when the body it's at its peak, that is when it's at its best. So all the years before 33, it's just still developing and getting better. But then all the years after 33, that's when the body starts to go downhill and starts to deteriorate, etc. So if the body is at its best and at its peak at 33, well, then if the body's going to be in heaven, then it would then make sense that it's going to be at its best, which would then be at the age of 33. This is a speculation. It's not a doctrine. We are not obligated to believe this, but it is a strong speculation, and there's reason to believe so. 
So again, my dear friends, there's a lot to look forward to in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I mentioned earlier, I referenced purgatory, and although purgatory is not traditionally part of the four last things, I think it's related enough for me to at least comment on it, at least in a brief manner. So when we commit sin here on earth, we could be forgiven of our sins through repentance, especially in the great sacrament of confession, but we still need to repair the damage that was created by our sins. For example, I could break my neighbor's window and he could forgive me for that action and we can be reconciled together in our relationship, but I still need to pay to repair the broken window. So we could be forgiven our sins, again, through repentance here on earth, but we still need to repair the damage that was created by our sins. And we try to repair as much damage as we can here on earth through prayer, penance, uh, acts of charity, etc. And when we die, and if we die in God's sanctifying grace, and if there's still damage that needs to be repaired, we have to go to purgatory. It's a state of purification to repair everything that's remaining where we cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven until it is all completely repaired. As it says in the book of Revelation, nothing unclean can enter, referring to entering into the kingdom of heaven. So, speaking of private revelations, again, Saint Maria Faustina claims in private revelation that she saw the vision of purgatory. So this can be found in her diary, Divine Mercy in My Soul. It will be worth mentioning what she saw. She said, I saw my guardian angel who ordered me to follow him. In a moment, I was in a misty place full of fire in which there was a great crowd of suffering souls. They were praying fervently but to no avail for themselves. Only we can come to their aid. The flames which were burning them did not touch me at all. My guardian angel did not leave me for an instant. I asked these souls what their greatest suffering was. They answered me in one voice that their greatest torment was longing for God. I saw Our Lady visiting the souls in purgatory. The souls call her the star of the sea. She brings them refreshment. I wanted to talk with them some more, but my guardian angel beckoned me to leave. We went out of that prison of suffering. I heard an interior voice which said, my mercy does not want this, but justice demands it. Since that time, I am in closer communion with the suffering souls. So my dear brothers and sisters of Christ, what is implied is we should offer up many, many prayers, sacrifices, and especially the holy sacrifice of the mass as mass intentions for the holy souls in purgatory that they may be quickly released into the kingdom of heaven. As the Lord taught in the gospel, do to others as we want them to do to us. I'm sure when we die in hope that we die in God's sanctifying grace, and if we are in purgatory, we will want those who are still here on earth offering up prayers and masses for us. So, as I mentioned earlier, that a death, the reality of death, can have, uh, it can possibly be discouraging. To, uh, to end on a positive note about death, because Christ has come, death has been changed into a blessing. Because Jesus Christ has come as the new Adam. Just like how the old Adam, through his disobedience, brought forth spiritual death, and physical death, Jesus Christ, the new Adam, through his obedience to the Father, he has brought forth spiritual death, especially through the sacraments and baptism, 
but he has also brought forth physical life. Excuse me, I mentioned spiritual death. He brought forth spiritual life through the sacraments and um, baptism. He also has brought forth physical life. That is, at the end of time, our bodies will rise from the dead. And we have the opportunity for our physical body to be there in the kingdom of heaven forever. So death has a positive meaning to it now, even to the point where a person can actually even desire to die. Not in some suicidal way in which a person doesn't believe that there's hope, but in such a manner that a person recognizes that the only way that they can see God is if they die. That's how much a person would desire to see God that they know that they have to pass through death. So the saints themselves echo this healthy desire to die. St. Paul says in the scriptures, my desire is to depart and be with Christ. St. Teresa of Avila once said, I want to see God, and in order to see him, I must die. St. Rose of Viterbo once said, live so as to not fear death. For those who live well in the world, death is not frightening, but sweet and precious. And I think a way in which a person cannot fear death is through vigilance which is what the message of Jesus was at the beginning of this talk as I quoted him from the gospel. Think about it in this way. You could think of a group of students who walk into the classroom and all of a sudden the teacher hands up an unexpected pop quiz without any prior notice. Well, the students who were good students, who always paid attention in class, who always did their homework, who had good study habits, those good students are always ready to pass the test. But the bad students, who never paid attention in class, who didn't do their homework, who had bad study habits, or even possibly had the attitude of procrastination, thinking, oh, I'll just be a better student later, well, those students have just set themselves up for failure. And the ultimate test, so to speak, that we know we need to pass is the moment of our judgment. So again, vigilance, always being ready to give an account of our life before God. And the church teaches about this principle in the catechism itself, paragraph 1014, quoting Thomas Kempis from his work called Imitation of Christ. It says, every action of yours, every thought, should be those of one who expects to die before the day is out. Death would have no great terrors for you if you had a quiet conscience. Then why not keep clear of sin instead of running away from death? If you aren't fit to face death today, it's very unlikely you will be tomorrow. And I would say and advise that one of the other most powerful ways that we could always be ready for death and always ready to give an account of our life to God is frequent confession. When we are absolved of our sins, especially if we fall into mortal sin, it's that sanctifying grace is restored back to our soul through the merits of Christ's redeeming blood, one on the cross flowing through the absolution that is administered by the priest. St. John Vianney once said this, If one said to those poor lost souls that have been so long in hell, we are going to, a, we are going to place a priest at the gate of hell. All those who wish to confess have only to go out. Do you think, my children, that a single one would remain? The most guilty would not be afraid of telling their sins, nor even of telling them before all the world. 
Oh, how soon hell would be a desert and how heaven would be peopled. Well, we have the time and the means which those poor lost souls have not. And when we're there in the confessional, we are, in a certain sense, in the shoes of St. Dismas, right? Who was crucified right next to Jesus Christ, although he was known as a criminal. It was through his repentance, his humility of acknowledging his sinfulness, that even though he died there before the Lord, because of his repentance, he stole one more thing. <laughs> he stole heaven. <laughs> so let us be in his shoes there before the Lord working through the ministry of the priest. My dear friends, I would just like to end my presentation tonight with one more quote from St. Faustina. This is, can be found in her diary, Divine Mercy in My Soul. She speaks about the two roads. She said, one day I saw two roads. One was broad, covered with sand and flowers, full of joy, music, in all sorts of pleasures. People walked along it, dancing and enjoying themselves. They reached the end without realizing it. And at the end of the road, there was a horrible precipice, that is, the abyss of hell. The souls fell blindly into it, as they walked, so they fell, and their number was so great that it was impossible to count them. And I saw the other road, or rather a path, for it was narrow and strewn with thorns and rocks, and the people who walked along it had tears in their eyes and all kinds of suffering befell them. Some fell down upon the rocks, but stood up immediately and went on. At the end of the road, there was a magnificent garden filled with all sorts of happiness, and all these souls entered there. At the very first instant, they forgot all their sufferings. So my dear brothers and sisters, I think we know what these two roads refer to. Let us gather our hearts now, gathered before the presence of our Lord, asking him for the grace, especially the grace of perseverance until the end, to persevere in God's sanctifying grace until the end. And also again, let us offer up these prayers for peace in the Ukraine. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a few brief repeat announcements, especially for the sake of those who are here tonight for the first time. Shortly after my announcements, we will have benediction, in which our Lord will bless us directly. So if you have a few more short minutes to stay for that, that would be great. And the text for the hymn and the responses and the divine praises are actually found in the inside cover of the back page of the Missalette, which is on the back shelves there in the back of the church. It would be ideal if you do grab that so that we can pray the divine praises together so that I do not 
have to have you repeat them. So just put that on your radar. Shortly after benediction, I again will continue to hear confessions until the last person. Uh, if you're not from this parish, uh, the confessional is just there in the back corner of the church. And if you need a guide to examine your conscience, there are examination conscience pamphlets at the ends of the pews and also on the back table there next to the holy water font. There is a plenary indulgence attached to those uh, to uh, attached to attending a parish mission. The church do document says a plenary indulgence is granted to those who attend a mission, hear some of the sermons, and are present for the solemn close of the mission. So some sermons means more than just one. You have to attend at least two of them, and one of them has to be attendance at the last night of the mission, which will be on Thursday night, in which we will actually end with the holy sacrifice of the Mass. We keep, of course, in mind the other usual conditions necessary to acquire a plenary indulgence. I sell CD sets on behalf of my religious community. I have brought some other mission sets and series and retreats that I've given in the past that you are not hearing this week. Also, the content that you're hearing this week, that series is called Thy Kingdom Come, and those CD sets will begin being available tomorrow Wednesday night, if you want a copy of those, for example, you may know people that you wish could be here this week. So those will be available tomorrow. I'm obviously putting that in the radar if you want to obviously bring any funds with you. I also have some other CD sets from some other Fathers of Mercy priests, so there's a wide variety of topics. Uh, those are available in the vestibule. There'll be salespeople there. Last but not least, the Fathers of Mercy do not charge any fee for our parish missions. We just run with whatever anyone wants to contribute to support our cause so that we can continue to do these types of things. So on the last night of the mission, Thursday, uh, during the Mass, there'll be an opportunity for a free will offering. If you feel so called by God to do so, obviously there'll be an opportunity. And if you write out any checks, you are to write them out to Fathers of Mercy. We realize that if you already know that you can't make it on Thursday and you still would like to make a contribution, there is a basket in the back of the church and you could just drop off your donation there. It will also be available tomorrow on Wednesday. Again, if you write out any checks, write them out to Fathers of Mercy. Thank you very much on behalf of my religious community for any contributions that you give to support our cause. Once again, thank you so much for your presence tonight. Hopefully you could come back tomorrow. You could be my recruiters, invite your friends, family, relatives, workmates. God's blessings on your night. Safe travels.